Good morning. Good morning, everyone. When we were preparing for this talk to talk with you about perspectives, we thought maybe we'd bring you in on a few projects we've been doing lately. Because to us, perspectives is about our senses. We all have them. What we hear, what we see, what we touch, what we smell, what we feel. And that all of these gives us different perspectives. We can be in the same room, doing the same thing, but still, our perspectives will be different. And so we're going to take you through some of the projects we have been doing, because to us, the senses really connect ourselves to ourselves, to others, and to the world around us. But before we do, we have a couple of disclaimers. First. Sign language is not a universal language. So I'm Paula Bath, and I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University from the Anthropology and Sociology Department. And in my master's, though, I looked at mainstream newspapers, and they say this a lot. They also say that sign language is actually a gestural code that allows spoken language to be accessible to deaf people. But that's not what this is. Sign languages are actually built and cared for by deaf people and all around the world. There's hundreds of sign languages around the world. In Canada, we have at least five. And today, we'll be using one, American Sign Language. But Tiffany is francophone. She uses Langue de Cinque Québécois, LSQ. So they, she may throw in one sign from that language time to time. Possibly. Thanks, Paula. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiffany Giraud. I'm a deaf artist. I use sign language, as Paula just mentioned. We're going to be using American Sign Language this morning, but I might throw in some LSQ. I'm also a mother of two wonderful children. I'm a visual storyteller, very visual storyteller. I do a lot uh, with the visual arts. I do puppetry as well, um, and it's a different type of puppetry. It's a puppetry that uh, really comes alive. Both Paula and I are the co-founders and co-directors of Spill Propagation, which is a center for the arts and sign language. It means that we work oftentimes with mixed teams of hearing artists and deaf artists. Now, Paula did the first disclaimer. I'll be uh, doing the second disclaimer. And the second disclaimer is that the voice that you're hearing is not my voice. We have interpreters with us today, but it's her voice that you're hearing. What you hear is an interpretation. It's not word for signed exact translation. That doesn't exist. However, the interpreters know me well, I know them well. We're doing our best today to bridge that communication between English and American Sign Language. But that is definitely something that I wanted to let you know. So again, I have no control over the words she picks for me as she represents my signs, but I thank them for their work. So for us, one of the most important things is not just talk about what we do, but why, why we do it. And so I'm going to start us off by telling you my why. Why I care about senses, why I'm doing a PhD, why do I do this work that we do, and where that why comes from. It goes back to the time that I was at the midwife's office. I was there. We brought our own interpreter because we knew that if we showed up, they wouldn't have brought one for us. I'm married to a deaf person. I'm in the waiting room. My partner's looking at books of like baby bums and flower pots. I'm looking at books, the stages of gestational development and how the child looks like a seahorse that day. <laughs> we walked into the midwife's office and said, huh, there's not enough chairs. There's three of us. The midwife looks at us and says, what is going on here? Took one look at the interpreter, 
grabbed her by the elbow, and threw her out of her office and closed the door. She came back into the mm -hmm. room. She looked at me. You can hear. You can talk. You interpret. All I remember in that moment was feeling a squeeze on my leg holding me back. And all I could do was close my eyes, have her words come through my ears, and out my hands. Later on, I asked my partner, why did you do that? Why didn't you let me go? And they said, because I didn't want you to ruin the moment. So I always wanted to know why. Many people after that moment, when I told them that story, they said to me, oh, that was a very big, obvious communication barrier. But you know what? It didn't feel like that. It wasn't a communication barrier. So what I wanted to do in this project is I wanted to ask people, what is your sensory experience communicating? A lot of people have been telling me their stories, and these are some, some examples of these stories that people are telling me. I asked my interpreter that day, would you give me your story? What was your sense? This was what she gave me. We were on the other side of that door. And I loved what she said. She said, in that moment, I'm going, do I go in, do I not? Do I push in, do I not? Do I stay, do I go? And she said, but the weirdest thing was my interpreter training program never taught me what to do when I get kicked out. <laughs> so to me, that door isn't a communication barrier. A language barrier, maybe. We can't see the sign language. It's opaque. But a communication barrier, no. There's a lot of communications. Our senses are active all the time. We're hearing, seeing, feeling things. That communication ha happened. That door has communication. So true. So now we'd like to talk about sense walking and what that means. It's really a concept that is based on the reflection of a particular time and place, and really being aware of one's surroundings, perceiving that as we walk. Now, of course, the sense walk is actually opening up all of the senses, all of the senses in your body, your eyesight, smell, auditory sight, visuals, all of the sensations that you can think of is what we want to incorporate in a sense walk. So now we have a small activity for you. We'll move over to uh, the open space to my left, which is just over here. Uh, so I'll ask everybody to just please get up and follow me. Now, a lot of people say that it's misguided for people to want to understand the lived experiences of deaf people most will plug their eyes, plug their ears, rather. So go ahead, plug your ears. It's actually not that. Most people, and our good friend and researcher, Robert Servage, who you can see on the screen here, is a great friend and researcher and colleague of ours, and this is from his quote, most people do assume that to understand the experiences of a deaf person, you would go ahead and just plug your ears, but that's not it. In fact, if you wanna understand how deaf people perceive and experience the world, really wanna experience it, you should walk backwards. So go ahead, walk backwards. Wonderful. Can you go back a little bit more? We've reached the back. Okay. So on that note, keep that feeling and come back to your seats.
So I'm curious, what was the experience just recently? I'll ask a few volunteers to give me in one word your description of a feeling that you had during that sense walk. Any volunteers? Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm, okay. Tentative is a good word, and it's true. Yeah, and that, that actually represents our experience on a daily basis, being a deaf person. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Awkward. Awkward, for sure. Mm-hmm. So if you think uh, of my daily activities, or any deaf person's daily activity, that's definitely a feeling that we carry with us every day. Every day, every situation, are there interpreters present? Will I be able to communicate? That walking backwards feeling is really a feeling that we live with every day. So to us, those words are different sensory perspectives. And that our bodies are these resonant chambers where those senses come reverberating to us through our bodies and then back out into the world. So the next piece that we're wanting to show you is now how in a project we started to work intersensorial. So we started to take two people or multiple people and how we worked across the senses between deaf people. So deaf and hearing people come from two very different sensory perspectives and how they relate to the world. That's obvious, but we all do. So we are, we've took um, one project, which was working with Ellen Waterman. So she's a flutist, improvisational flutist. And then we worked with Tefen, right, deaf storyteller. And so a part of this process was what I call sense transference. So you think about a moment, like you just had a moment walking backwards. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? What did you perceive? What did you spell? And then you take that experience, awkward, right? We heard, tentative, we heard. And then you transfer that into an object or an illustration or a, a poem, or a video, and you, you like transfer that internal feeling of awkward and tentative, and then you throw it out into the world into like a, a material. And then we look at it, and we talk about it. So that's what I did with these two. I didn't know, she's a flutist. <laughs> you can't get more non-visual than, than a flute. So what we've just done is we've given out two vibrational pillows to two members of the audience. Okay, great. So just hold on to those. So part of this process was like, well, how are we going to cross that sensorial bridge, right? Like, how are we going to do this? And so that was our first attempt, was to bring in a vibrational pillow. So I'm going to play the first thing that Ellen gave to fan, like her first sense material. It's called a score. So her first sense score was an actual MP3 unit file that then she uh, handed to, to fan. I'll play it for about 50 seconds. Great. So I'm just curious, the people that had the vibrational pillows, did you feel anything? No? Nothing, eh? Okay, so you got the same feeling I got. Uh, no, it was seriously the same thing. I also tried it with a, a vibrational vest to see if it would work a little bit better. It didn't. 
uh, I was really struggling, and I'm very sensitive to vibrations. I thought, well, because I'm more sensitive to vibrations, I'll be able to catch it. No. So what we did, uh, the process um, is that Ellen uh, was working with me and with Paula as well as she was explaining, but with her first draft, Ellen inspired herself of the painting that you saw on the previous um, slide. And so she recorded um, her piece and sent it uh, to me in a USB. Now, of course, we're not speaking the same language, and it's a little bit difficult, as Paula was saying, to cross that bridge. How do we develop something so that we can use intersenses to connect, to express, to respond? So I wasn't quite sure how to do it, but you can see on the left-hand side there on the picture, there's a vibrational vest made by... Uh, uh, vibration fusion lab uh, and so we borrowed one of their vests to see if we could uh, get an, inter an interpretation it didn't work very well so in the picture you can also see my son who uh, can hear and so I asked him to listen to the flute and try to interpret um, in his way what the sounds were like and so he was like oh yeah mom the sounds are really really high and he was explaining his interpretation and so I was using that using the vest to try and really grab the different pieces the the different senses to try to piece together meaning from all of that so with that experience I kind of visualized being in a car. Now, if you can visualize being in a car when it's raining very, very heavily and the, the rain is really hitting that windshield, uh, you can feel that vibration, right? You can see it, you can see it hit the car and you can feel the vibrations and you can see the water drip, 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 drip. And so that's really what came to mind for me with all of that information. And so my response was to draw. You see the picture on the right? Uh, you can see the car with the rain hitting uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the windshield. And uh, to me, it was also felt like it was very windy. Uh, so from head to toe, there was a lot of wind in my visualization. You could probably see it in the center of the picture there. That was my perspective of this piece. Uh, given to me via all these different senses. And so what I did, I took the, uh, the drawing and sent it over to Ellen. I was also wondering if I could represent that a little bit differently. Now, I'd like to note that we did this project during COVID, and so I was at home, Ellen was at home in her space, in her studio, uh, and so at home I had a Tibetan bowl that I filled with water uh, and, uh, you know, created a sound by banging on the side of it. Uh, and what I did, the reason I filled it with water is because, to me, that's a really visual way to show, not just hear the vibrations, but to show the vibrations. So you can take a look, there's a short clip here. So I felt that that experience would also help Ellen in, uh, in her response. Over to you, Paula. What I also did was I rolled up a blank piece of chart paper, like you saw Tiffan drew, and I thought that was a great idea to then give her the opportunity to express herself through drawing too. So I rolled it up and I gave it to her, the, the flutist, and she looked at me and went, I ain't touching that, like, I am not doing that. So it was really interesting to see how people also have comfort zones and you have limits. So it's okay to try putting your fingers in that bowl to touch the water. I'm sure most people would be like, okay, I can do that, but maybe to draw, you know, it, it goes beyond your limits. It's not the way that you can actually authentically express yourself. So we learned that too through that piece. So from this work, which we thought was super interesting, was that we started to do a sense walk, we started to do a sense walk together. 
with other people. And what um, was really interesting is you could see that her first piece that she gave to Fan was on an MP3, audio only. But by the time we got to the end of the process, she created a beautiful video with, uh, that was visual, that incorporated lots of different instruments and movement. And what she said was that one of the outcomes for her, in terms of her sensory expansion, was to say that as a flutist, she never realized the extent of the vibration that exists on her fingertips. She had never felt that before. And she oh my goodness, it was like an awakening to her, which was beautiful, among so many other things. But then to Fan, you know, Ellen doesn't use sign language, right? And so, and she never learned. We were only together for a few months. But to Fan said that she never felt a communication barrier. And so another big reason why we say, you know, let's move beyond conversations about language and get into our bodies and into the senses and how we can do these sense walks together. So again, my question that I've been asking is what is your sensory experience communicating? Again, these are a few examples that people have been giving me. And what I've been seeing is that there's two experiences largely. One is thriving. You're thriving in communication. That means you have a sense of autonomy, not awkward, right? You have autonomy. People talk about it in the form of butterflies, movement sporadic and free, you also have a common ground. There's a stability there. You can come into a space and know that all those pieces are going to be in the place and that you're taken care of. That communication is not just sign language and it's not just language, but there's going to be like multiple tools, multiple ways to be able to communicate and meeting people's needs in real time, in real space. And that all of this kind of accumulates into a sense of oneness. Like a togetherness is how they, people have been describing it to me. The other category, so that was thriving in communication. The other ca category is surviving that communication. And Tafan is going to share us some examples about that. Sure, absolutely. I think that surviving in communication is a really good way to explain it, Paula. And these are examples here. I mean, every day for me, communication can be very stressful. It's stress-inducing. It can cause a lot of confusion, and it can cause a lot of fatigue. Uh, one person experienced communicating as a cold metal ruler. Um, I would add an example, you know, if I want to take a, an interest course or a post-secondary course, any kind of course that I want to take, my first question is, is there interpreting services? And most of the time people will say, well, I'm sorry, Tiffany, we don't have any money for that. Uh, you know, maybe bring a friend, bring a family member. Um, so that's the example of the cold metal ruler being that example of communicating, right? It, it's, it's, it's cold, it has sharp edges, it's not smooth, it doesn't feel like there's a common ground at all. Um, and I think that that's a really good example. And actually, I'm going to ask the interpreter right now to just stop interpreting. Okay, I'll ask you to start interpreting now. Thanks. So with the few minutes we have left, from our tracing and mapping of our senses communicating, we say that communication is a lot about wellness. Incorporating these perspectives, these sensory perspectives is important to communicating because communication is how we relate to ourselves and to each other and to the whole world around us. And that we need to check in to see how are we doing? 
how are we doing, how are you doing, and how are you doing as in the other person in that space? Are you thriving or are you surviving? And to do that, we really want to start having conversations that go beyond language and language barriers and to really get connected to the sense of that communication is happening all the time and how that impacts us and how that impacts other people. And that we can play in our discovery to expand our own sensory reaches, go on your own sense walks, go on a sense walks with other people, and to really play in that space that you too can find those vibrations underneath your fingertips. So that we all can experience a deeper sense of that resonation, communication, and that connection between you and me and the world. This is a sign we created, we made up for it. So you can have that too, we could all have that. So thanks everyone, thanks for participating, thanks for being here, thanks to the organizers, thank you Marwan for the invitation, and thank you to our interpreting team. Merci. Thank you both so much. That was such a wonderful talk and such an incredible way to bring us into your perspective, Tefan. Um, it, it feels like a privilege to get a glimpse of what you go through every day. So appreciate you both sharing your story and uh, for putting in all this effort into an amazing talk. Uh, we have some time for questions if uh, you've got some out there. Just put up your hand and we'll run a microphone out to you. Um, Oh, and one disclaimer, if you'd like to ask a question in ASL, please come up to the stage and ask it. Uh, so my question is, you know, we miscommunicate when we speak with one another, just using regular language. And so I'm curious around um, the miscommunication that happens um, when you can't hear and someone is speaking. And then how do you bridge that gap between, with that? There's a lot of options, I think, to answer your question. And I don't think that it's a one size fits all. It really depends on who you're communicating with. Uh, if you're communicating with me, I really like to have those visual exchanges. So you can use your body. You can use gestures. You can write back and forth. You can draw me a picture if you want. Uh, I know that there are a lot of artists in the room. Uh, and we have other deaf individuals in the room as well. So do you want to give your perspective? I was going to say, actually, too, I was going to pick on Vika because she's in the audience. Um, I was going to say that one of her pieces is actually on the screen. Yeah, I don't know if you saw it, but if anyone saw the goggles, there was goggles. That's her piece. And it was a, talking about her experience being forced to lip read, that somehow lip reading was visual and accessible. And so she was explaining that, and I'll let her explain her experience in response. I always find myself in the position of accommodating others' needs for communication. I have to have many backups um, as a deaf person. Um, going out and trying to access communication on a day-to-day -day basis feels like a fight sometimes, feels like a war. It can take a lot more time for me to achieve what I need to achieve in my life based on people who use spoken language barriers arise and things come up and challenges are presented and I'm constantly forced to lip read. English isn't even my first language, but I find myself in the position of having to lip read very regular. English words look all very similar to me. Um, the mouth morphemes and shapes. Um, and that's one of the most common questions I get. Well, do you read lips? Um, and then of course, you know, English, Mouth shapes might even look for other, look like other language mouth shapes as well. 
And I reflect back to when I was going to school um, and I was forced to read lips for a long time. Um, and I opted to switch schools um, and I was working with a teacher who, was, who had a very clear way of speaking and I was able to lip read her and I would always kind of uh, spy on her and share with the other deaf and hard of hearing students what she was saying. So, um, and I'd sometimes get in trouble for that because they thought it wasn't accessible but can be an advantage as well. Thanks very much. I also, also wanted to respond was just that we often find if we shut off our voices, we'll get farther in those moments, use other things to communicate through than voice if there's no interpreter present and, and play with that. Um, I've got a question. Um, thank you. Is this the sign for thank you? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you got it. I, you mentioned, you know, like we're all familiar with ASL. I just learned today a little bit more about LSQ, is that what you called it? I'm curious about what you know um, about other people in, well, around the world um, who are, um, who are non-speaking people, experience deafness, and, and what other forms of sign language exist around the world, and if you've had experience communicating with people whose languages are not English and French first? Like, what does sign language look like around the world? It's a good question. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're wanting to know about um, communication with different sign languages. I mean, there are over 240 sign languages in the world. Um, and so when deaf individuals want to communicate with other deaf individuals, I mean, there is one uh, kind, you could almost call it like a universal sign language, but it's really an amalgamation of a lot of um, commonalities from different sign language used for international conferences for people who are deaf. Uh, it's an international way of signing, which is very advanced. I don't think hearing people have an international way of communicating that includes sample sections of all of your spoken languages. <laughs> I went to an international deaf mountain biking festival in Mont Tremblant. They came from all over the world. Nobody had a problem communicating. They gestured, they pointed, you know, it just was able to, to communicate. And like Tiffan said, there is international sign language, which isn't actually a language, so that's the trick, because it's static and doesn't grow and evolve over time, really. It's, it, um, but it is a, it's a form of communication that the, the international deaf groups have been able to come together in. And, uh, and create it so they can communicate through signs that way. We did learn that to go. Exactly. One thing I would add is that when communicating deaf to deaf, we have that experience, right? We have that lived experience of maneuvering and negotiating the world around us, which is very, very similar. And so it does create a, a sense of community and understanding towards one another. And in Canada, we also have maritime sign language. <laughs> right? <laughs> Indigenous. Um, a lot of those languages, however, though, are in a critical condition. They're dying. The two languages that we have that are alive, that have the most even governmental support, are the ones that are alive. Languestine Québécois and American Sign Language. And LSQ, Languestine Québécois, is mostly in Quebec, but also can be found in other Francophone regions of Canada, like uh, New Brunswick, for example. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paula. Good day, and thank you so much for that. 
My um, beautiful grandson, who is seven years old, is autistic and nonverbal. And so when I see sign language, it's not just for those who are deaf. It's for those little ones who need to be communicated with. We are blessed with teachers who've chosen to pull together the opportunity to learn sign language to communicate with my grandson. And so all I get to say right now is thank you so much for the opportunity to say, you don't have to be deaf to require sign language. Thanks, thanks for your comment. Wonderful, and I agree with your comment. There's benefits for other people as well, and who knows, maybe there are people in this room that will, uh, that we've uh, you know, awakened a, a curiosity. It's, it's about perspective, and it's about really including a lot of those senses that we might not be tuning into. I think all hearing people who are even remotely interested would benefit from learning sign language. It flips your brain on its head because you're thinking 3D visually. And if anyone's ADHD, honestly, this, this language helps you deconstruct the words and you can actually speak in special space. Um, and uh, some friends tell me how liberating sign language is for them to communicate and how easier it is for them to pick it up. And so it's actually a wonderful language for, for hearing people to be able to think differently and relate differently in time and space because it is more visual, it's more honest, it's very transparent. When you have to explain something, you need to really explain it for it to make any visual sense. So it's fun too. Hi. Um, I was just wondering exactly about that. Um, how long does it take to get uh, to a, I don't know, conversational level in, uh, in this language? We're just caring for the interpreter because one actually had to leave at a particular time, so she's going to take care of that. Okay, so how long does it take to learn a sign language? Obviously, I'm 20 plus years and still learning. Fair. But you just got to start. And you, you probably could take a year or two to, to start using the sign language. But then if you work or um, socialize with deaf people, you use it. You know, you don't lose it, right? <laughs> so we really have to make sure that you just socialize and come out, meet the community. And um, that will really help with speeding up that um, fluency. But it probably would take a couple years for you to feel really confident and be able to carry a conversation. But it's well worth the effort and the time. Absolutely. Uh, I would also add to that, you know, any other language that you're using takes practice uh, and also takes that willingness to get out of your comfort zone. So really it's all about practicing. Uh, myself, I was born deaf and so uh, I was exposed to lip reading at first. I didn't really uh, get the, exp the exposure to sign language until later in life. Uh, I, you know, really in terms of communication, uh, I was in lack of communication and language from zero to age five. And when I first started, it was the LSF, uh, Langue des Signes de la France, that I was exposed to. And as soon as I saw that, oh, I picked it up so quickly. Uh, I, I did that, and then simultaneously I learned to read lips. Uh, I don't, I'm out of practice now, and so I don't read lips uh, here in Canada. And then when I moved to Canada, I was 14 years old years old uh, and I was I was much more independent and much more free and I would say more um just a stronger individual, you know? I uh, really found my identity in LSQ. And so I learned LSQ when I moved to Canada. I was about 14. And being immersed in that culture every day, it took me about a year to really uh, 
you know, get a good grasp on the language. But languages are different for everyone. We all learn differently. Some people are more auditory, some people are more visual. But as Paula said, practice makes perfect. And, you know, we're still learning every day, even after 20 years. So, um, yeah. And even... I would also say uh, that some people struggle visually, like... You know, some people just have an easier time with languages than others, so it just depends on, on your learning style as well. And there's a shortage of sign language interpreters in Canada, so if that speaks to anyone, please see us. We will be happy to get you on that path. And the more spoken languages you know, the better, especially in this region. Well, thank you both so much.